Think at Hawaii Asia and Reveal. I'm Johnson Choi, the host. Our guest today is Professor Patricio Abinas. Our topic today is very interesting. It's about the new president of Philippines, uh, Rodriguez Duntate. Professor, welcome to the uh, show. Thank you, Mr. Choi. Okay, before yeah. I uh, bring ask for the professor uh, some question about the happening in Philippines, uh, maybe I will give a a uh, uh, quick recap. Uh, because of the program today, I spent my last month actually go out and, and did some of my own research, uh, not strictly from the Philippine perspective, but talking to my friends, uh, primarily in China, Hong Kong, and Taiwan. And also, uh, since I spent a lot of time in San Francisco, there's a huge uh, Filipino population in, in San Francisco. And uh, last week, before I returned to Hawaii, I also spent three days in Las Vegas. And surprisingly, there's a lot of uh, Filipino uh, workers in the casinos. So with the program in mind, I do ask a lot of those uh, more like blue collar type of workers, uh, both in San Francisco and also in Las Vegas. And how do they like about the new president of uh, Philippines? Surprisingly, everybody likes him, just like the poll number in, in, uh, in Philippines with 85% uh, plus approval rate. But when I ask some of the people about the more elite group, that means those are the businessmen and those are with a strong tie with the American business. And the answer is quite different. Uh, they were disappointed. So with that in mind, I guess they are, uh, depends on which sector of the population he belongs to. And because what happened to the, in Philippines, and before Donald Trump got elected, a lot of people compare him to uh, to, Tate, to uh, the, the Donald Trump of Philippines. <laughs> And today I listened to the Taiwan uh, talk show. Uh, there's another businessman like Donald Trump in, in uh, Taiwan who built all the iPhone for uh, Apple. And people speculating that in 2020, he may want to run for president of, the, of Taiwan. And so it looks like the old tradition career politicians uh, uh, have to watch out because maybe the tie has changed. Okay, Professor, mm. uh, do you have anything that you want to add to my uh, comments? Well, the 30 actually, President the 30 likes uh, President elect Trump for one reason that they swear. Oh, okay. Uh, <laughs> but if you compare their political careers to each other, they're very much uh, far different. Far different uh, yeah. The 30 comes from a political family, uh, uh, Mr. Trump doesn't. He's run Davao City as mayor for 23 years okay. and quite successfully. And Davao City is one of the quote unquote safest and uh, most comfortable place to live in the Philippines. So he brings that with them. Uh, um, uh, Trump doesn't have, Mr. Trump doesn't have that political experience. So um, let me bring to another uh, area that uh, before. Uh, he got elected uh, under the Aquino uh, administration uh, uh, with the help of the American and Japan. They went to the Hague Court mm -hmm. and uh, filed a complaint or against China. And I think uh, the court ruling said uh, China uh, lost. Okay. Yes. And uh, and when uh, Duterte uh, took office, uh, he took a 180 degree turn. Yes. Uh, and of course, there are different reasons he, he said that in the, in the media. One of the reasons he said is, U.S. has no money, China has. Yes. And, and China has the money to help Philippines to build up the infrastructure and employment. Yes. Uh, what, what, what's your take on that? Well, two things. One is, if you, there's, compared to the other parts of Asia, the Chinese investments in the Philippines are quite very low. But the question is, where are the investments? Most of the investments are in this island, the home of Mindanao. Uh, the Chinese, uh, there's high, heavy Chinese uh, importation of export crops, pineapple, bananas, fish, uh, and that comes from the southern Philippines. Um, second is there is growing Chinese investment in the mining industry. And so in northeastern Mindanao Island, that's where, you know, the big deposits of copper, different kinds of metals that China needs um, are, are located. Um, and the Philippine government have been trying to liberalize mining laws to bring in more investors. Uh, 
American and Australian investors are coming in, but they have to face problems with their environmental groups back home. The Chinese don't have that. Okay. Yeah. So. I, I visited Manila uh, three times uh, about 10, 10 years ago, and yes. I noticed that uh, uh, office when I went there through the introduction of my uh, Chinese uh, uh, friends there, and I found that uh, most of the Chinese uh, in, at least in the Manila area, I don't know about the other part of the Philippines, uh, they do quite well. In fact, they live in residential complexes, pretty secure with guards and stuff like that. And um, I, I, I know that uh, uh, the Chinese has been uh, in other, I don't know about Philippines, like Indonesia or Thailand, the Chinese uh, uh, play a very important role in the business side. Mm -hmm. So with the warming relationship uh, with uh, China, uh, how do you feel the, the Chinese uh, Filipino may be playing a more important role? On well, the first culturally, uh, Mr. Choi, the Chinese have always been part of Philippine society. I see, I see. My grandfather, for example, his first language was Hokkien, okay, okay. not Filipino, not Cebuano. Like my mom, my mom was yeah. from <laughs> Because he was adopted by the local Chinese see, family. Um, so there is already that long friendship between Filipino, Chinese, and Filipino Filipinos. Uh, my mother used to teach piano in my hometown. 95% of her students are Chinese. So when I was growing up, for example, I thought there were two New Years. Oh, okay. A Christian New Year. Okay. And this New Year, we're, we're the only Filipino in the community, in the, in the, in the house. And the Chinese grandmothers would teach me how to curse in Chinese. <laughs> okay. So there is already the deep friendship between Chinese, especially outside of Manila. I see. You, Chinese don't need to be protected. In the, live in suburban villages. They're part of the the, the village. They're part of the community. Uh, my classmates are Chinese. Uh, I think my grandfather's side, uh, we have Chinese blood because I have cousins who are Chinese looking. And so that's a big factor. The second factor really is, um, because uh, Chinese have been, unlike other minorities in, say, Indonesia, the Chinese in the Philippines, hell or high water, if there's a political crisis, they don't get their investments out. They don't take away their investment. They keep in the Philippines. Um, a couple of them left when, in the 1980s when there were kidnapping of Chinese businesses, but the majority of Chinese businesses, small, medium, and large, stay in the Philippines. And that's been a big factor uh, in terms of why this government say, well, the Chinese, they were always with us. The third thing is Chowden, China. Uh, the Philippines was one of the endpoints of Chinese migration in the 50s, but as, as far back as the 1930s. So uh, it's silent Chinese, a lot of the Chinese then moved there. Uh, China was close when it became communist, but in 1980, Deng Xiaoping opened China. Right. And so these families were reconnected. Right. And so, if Chinese Filipinos have investments in China, these are mainly in the southern China. I see. The Guangzhou, the area. The Guangzhou area, yeah. yeah I, I know that there's a lot of Filipinos also work in Hong Kong, too. Precisely. It's almost 300,000 yeah. of them, yeah. So if in Indonesia, they are anti-Chinese. There's anti-Chinese riots in Malaysia and Indonesia. In the Philippines, you don't see that. I see, I see. Uh, Especially in the provinces, I grew up in the provinces, and that's it. So, so, so I noticed that you know because my wife' uh, family uh, was Chinese that uh, moved to Indonesia, uh, mm -hmm. um, you know, uh, generations ago, and they mentioned to me that yeah, from time to time, you know, they, you know, they riot against the Chinese. Right. Uh, so, if if Philippines has a more uh, friendly uh, attitude towards uh, Chinese Filipino, and isn't that a, a shame that it cannot be developed in a more uh, better business relationship with China? That's developing now. Okay. As early as 1980s, okay. for example, okay. Filipino Chinese began to talk with their cousins that okay. they haven't okay. seen for a while in southern China and say, how do we set this up? So one of the uh, Filipino Chinese uh, uh, families, for example, the C family, has opened up malls in southern China, I see. Um, uh, Schumart. Uh, um, and then there's partnership also on ex export export crops, uh, export the export of uh, Philippine goods to China. Uh, in the past, before when China was communist, we used to my mother used to get smuggled goods from via Singapore from China. You know, Chinese toothpaste, smelling the spam, yeah. the Philippine spam. But now you can buy it in the time uh, there. Um, so I think that con that will continue to grow, and that's the basis why President Duterte said, "Well, I, I like China more." than the U.S. I see. Uh, since I talked to a few uh, 
uh, elite type of Filipinos, mm -hmm. uh, both in the West Coast, in fact, uh, about four or five in Hawaii, and, and, and they are in the business, and they are very connected with the, you know, the American business, and, and they more or less refuse to, <laughs> because I want them to talk about more, a, a little bit, a good thing about the current uh, president of Philippines, instead right. of attacking him, not, right. not why, why the elite and, 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 and the people that are well connected with American uh, Fortune 100, 500 business mm. is so, does, don't like him at all? I think there's a double, it's a double face here. Uh, Filipino elites and Filipino American elites supported him because of his anti-drug campaign. Okay. So the image of the Philippines from the U.S. and I think Europe is that it's a very unstable country. I see. So that's a criminality going on. And now comes the third day that like Clint Eastwood tends to clean okay. that. And that's good for business. What they did not expect was that he was anti-American. And so there's this big surprise that he started cursing at President Obama and calling the American ambassador gay. Okay. That was something they didn't expect. And I okay. kept telling them that, you know, if you studied him carefully, uh -huh. he's always been that, anti-drugs, but also consistently anti-American. I see. Because of some personal experience he's had when he was mayor with Americans. Yeah. Yeah. And so they're surprised now. And, and, and I understand why they didn't know much about him because who knew about Odarty until he won the presidency? Right, right, he right. was a mayor. Right. Uh, uh, he was known as the Punisher. Uh, if you go to Davao, it's a very clean place. But you cannot imagine, you could not imagine him then becoming president. I see, I see. So, like before the program, we were talking about, you know, uh, you know, maybe he learned a few tricks from the American, you know, like, you know, a lot of time when American go to China, you know. Uh, of course, you know, Obama would not swear in the, in the TV, but they will throw <laughs> everything from the garbage can to the sink to the to the president of china before he take the trip to china i mean i and you know you know maybe 15 years ago the chinese government was real upset you know but after all the president are doing the same thing you know they they all know that oh it's just a show i mean they they yeah. they do it for the you know local audience yeah. and i guess uh now when Duterte do it and then i guess it's a wake-up call for the american they say oh my god we've been doing that to, <laughs> to others you know how could they imagine a small country like philippines or a mayor for that matter <laughs> or mayor yeah. i know have the nerve right well the, because he's a mayor uh <laughs> as i uh, mentioned in other forum local politics mayor politics in the philippines that's how they talk they that's curse right. at each other they threaten each other and in one form i even mentioned that when he started talking like that yeah. he reminded me of my aunts oh, okay they cursed like that i, see, I, I mean see. uh filipino mothers are scary I see. <laughs> <laughs> and so it's very normal for me to hear that okay. because i grew up in the south i grew up in a small town but filipinos in manila and i guess abroad are not used to it because if you become president you're supposed to learn how to talk in diplomatic language. That's what they're trying to tell Donald Trump right now. Yeah, he doesn't <laughs> care. Duterte doesn't care because he's very much aware that when he talks, he's talking to Filipinos, not to Americans. Okay, so uh, we go on uh, for a break, a short break right now. So when we come back, we're going to uh, talk to Professor a little bit more about uh, the exciting and, <laughs> and, and uh, Duterte of Philippines. Aloha, my name is Mark Shklov. I am the host of Law Across the Sea. Please join me every other Monday to hear lawyers from Hawaii discussing ways to reach across the sea and help people and bring people together. Aloha. Aloha, I'm Carl Campagna. I hope you please visit us this summer. It's a wonderful summer. It's actually a cooler summer than we're used to. But I hope that you come back and visit us and watch our show, Education, Movers, Shakers, and Reformers, here on Think Tech Hawaii. It's at noon every Wednesday. See you then. Hi, I'm Kili'i Akina, president of the Grassroot Institute. I'd love you to join us every week, Mondays at 2 o'clock p.m. for Ehana Kako. Let's work together. We report every week on the good things going on in our state, as well as the better things that can go on in the future. We have guests covering everything from the economy, the government, and society. See you Mondays on Ehana Kako at 2 o'clock p.m. Until then, I'm Kili'i Akina. Aloha. Thank you, Hawaii Asian Review. This is Johnson Choi, the host. Uh, our host, our guest today is Professor Abinai. Uh, before we uh, went to commercial, we talked about you know um, the way how people talk, you know, non, in the non-traditional uh, politician uh, say things, uh, which is eye opener with the 
with the president of the Philippines now with the uh, president of the uh, United States. You know. mm -hmm. uh, for some people, I think they may like it because uh, before the politician doesn't always uh, tell you the truth. Now at least they speak their mind and they don't have to second guess you know, <laughs> what, what they are actually talking about, right? right. Uh, one, uh, one of the big controversies, I guess, one of the uh, American uh, or, or the Philippine elite uh, doesn't like the new president of Philippines because after he uh, set aside uh, the ruling by the hate court, he also said uh, he wanted to get the American military out of Philippines. You know, as we may know, the Philippines, uh, you know, there's a, a country along the Southeast Asia that American use. Uh, military to contain China and Philippines is a very important piece of that mm -hmm. uh, that pie. And when Philippine uh, president say, "Oh, maybe from now I'm going to work with China more," and at worst he said, "Going to work with, with Russia." <laughs> <laughs> so that raised a wide brow for 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 a lot of people. In, in fact, uh, on TV uh, not too long ago, he said uh, he may not live through the, his presidency, the six years. He said that, not me. Mm -hmm. Okay. Yeah. And of course, there's a lot of president, a lot of people speculate that who is going to take him out. So I'm not going to go into a conspiracy theory right now. But based on your understanding that what he talked about the military alliance, uh, what's your take on that? Well, the, remember the Philippines kicked out the U.S. bases in 1991. Right. And so the U.S. only began to go back to the Philippines and reestablish ties with the Philippines after the global war on terror. So what has happened now is instead of bases, American bases being returned, the, the push is on joint military exercises between the Philippine and the American military, especially the Marines in Okinawa. Uh, the second one is to allow the U.S. Uh, some offices or small bases within Philippine bases. And I guess you're right. Uh, it's part of President Obama's pivot to Asia, and the target is, of course, China. Uh, when President Duterte said that, uh, there was a lot of controversy uh, and a lot of complaints, in part because of two things. Uh, the Philippine military, since 1946, has always been a military trained under the U.S. system. So it's promotions, the way tactics, political, military education, from the guns down to uh, the kinds of tactics they use is very much influenced by uh, the United States. And even up to now, Filipino soldiers, officers are sent first to the United States, second to Australia, and I think Japan, in terms of further training. So there is a tension there because the Philippine military, especially in the South, has been working well with American special forces in containing Islamic terrorists. Uh, the Philippine South is like a border. Anybody can go in and out of there. It's a wonderful zone of smugglers and pirates and terrorists. So the special forces, your special forces provide intelligence for the Philippine Marines in that area. Now, if they withdraw, then the Philippines, our military is not as developed as the United States, will have to rely on very primitive intelligence networks. So that's the main complaint. The second complaint, of course, is, uh, you know, if you change to China and Russia, what happens to the guns? What happens to I mean, everything, equipment that's been, yeah, is American based? So you have to transform all of that. Now, that said, there is actually among the senior officers of the military who are also nationalists, who think that even if they, are rel they rel rely on the United States and are close allies in the United States, the United States can only say much. This is our army. This is the Philippines. I met some colonels in the Philippine South who said, you know, sometimes these U.S. special forces are just pulling, are pushing all over the place, and we push back. So there is also that sentiment uh, there. But in general, I think the Philippine military is very much, you know, bothered by his shift to China and Russia. So actually, right now, the... Uh the military personnel in 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 Philippines is very limited, more on the advisory uh, capacity, right? Not taking any like An complex type of. Right? Well, they say just they intelligence not, advisory, right? but, but I think know, in the right? south uh, they did involve. They were involved. Well, America, um, American, you know, USA is very uh, uh, has a lot actually, you know, uh, bases all around the world. Not necessarily have to be staffed by people, but they are ready. Yes. Uh, very, you know, like overnight or two days or three days, you can convert into a a a a a, 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 a launching uh, stage or whatever you want to call it. Yes. Um, but 
whatever Duterte's uh, uh, warming up relationship with uh, with uh, uh, China also uh, becoming uh, contagious in the sense that now other countries like uh, Malaysia. Indonesia, Malaysia, uh, Thailand always been close to China anyway. Yeah, and, I was in uh, Cambodia too. So it become a very uh, bad influence, I mean, from the American point of view. The first, you know, the American and the Japan have a, such a big showcase of the hate that say, well, China, you know, China lost the case, right? And the next thing he say, hey, I'm sorry, I'm not going to even talk about it for now, you know? Right, right. And I know that China also plays smart now. They allow the, the Philippine fishermen to go back to the dispute island to start fishing, right. you know, without interference. So, so at least China say, okay, let's set aside our dispute. I mean, when you talk about money, we can always make the money together. We don't right. have to like point gun at each other. I mean, China has always been that attitude, you know. Mm -hmm. we don't, they don't go out and tell you what to do. Right. <laughs> right? If there's money to be made, let's talk about it on the table and settle it. I mean, yeah. that's, that's the Chinese way. Uh, so the discomfort, uh, with also with the new president of the uh, of, of United States, they also start saying that, uh, if you want me to defend you, uh, pay more money. Right. You think that will also, uh, uh, you know, you, you think he will actually, you know, he told Japan the same thing, told Taiwan the same thing. I mean, you think Philippines will be... Well, the, <laughs> the interesting thing is the Philippines is in the lowest of the totem pole see, of American interest. Meaning, if you're talking about bases that can be converted into launching pads, you're talking about Japan I see, I and see. even Singapore. Yeah. The Philippines is just, uh, I mean, remember the Philippine military, the U.S. military initially, was advising the Philippines against counterinsurgents, communists, and separatist interests. So it's an internal force, uh, and it's now just beginning to be an external force. So, um, so if uh, uh, Mr. Trump says, "Well, we're not going to pay anymore for military uh, so, uh, aid to these countries," I think the Philippines will be the last to, you know, yes. will benefit much, and it probably the be the first to say, "Okay, we don't care." Uh, in fact, there's move now to like buy more guns from Israel or more weapons from Israel, Korea. Right. Uh, so there, there's a diversification, apparently. Uh, so I stand corrected on my earlier statement. So uh, the ones who will be worried are the guy, the countries with the big bases, no? uh, Japan especially, and Korea. Well, I, I think, you know, Singapore is, 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 is such a small nation. And, mm -hmm. and even though uh, it's strategically located, I mean, they, you know, it's hard for Singapore to take side and try to be, right. play as much neutral as possible. Right. Japan, of course, relies so much on the American. Right. Uh, and actual military, Japan is, is quite strong. I mean, yeah, they're strong, yeah. They disguise it as a defense force. Yeah. But, you know, who said a gun as a defense weapon cannot use to shoot other people, right? <laughs> so. Yeah, but the joke in Southeast Asia is they're the worst military <laughs> well. because they have no combat experience. But I want to go back to this. As, as the Association of Southeast Asian Nations, they know they're small. Right. So they're caught between the Chinese and the United States. And if you look at the history of the ASEAN, they know how to play they, they play one against uh, each other to be able to survive. So Vietnam, for example, they're ramming each other's ship with China, but right. Chinese investment into Vietnam continue to grow. Right, right. So this sort of, uh, it's an actory, an interesting dance that's going on. And I think the Philippines is just starting to learn because the previous president was really pro-US. Right, right. And with Duterte, there's an opportunity there so let's say if we can do the same dance as the Vietnamese, the Singaporeans, the Cambodians, and the Laos are doing. So it's going to be an interesting time. You know what I say to Tate is very smart. When he go to China, he got a lot of uh, loan. Yeah. He got an investment, right? Yeah. Because he say the right things, and he had a warming relationship with China. Right. China, you have to understand China, okay? China, historically, never want to beat down the, the nation. They think they're smaller than them. You know, historically, if you are not going to challenge mm. them, they always give you something, yes. right? And Dotari go to Japan, he played the same game, right? So Abi will give him a bunch of stuff, right? Precisely. Right? So I think he is very smart. I mean, he, he, he knows how to play, right? So he doesn't take side at the same time. He say the right thing to please right. whoever yeah. he is talking to. Right. And, and that's, the, that's the characteristics of a lot of Southeast Asian right, leaders, right. to be able to play. Uh, to be able to sort of sort uh, play the big powers against each other. But he plays so well in such a short time. Well, he's very so well. Um, <laughs> and, but I had to go back to the long relationship with China. As early as the 12th century, the Chinese were actually be trading already with the Philippines. Right. The Manchu dynasty, the Ming dynasty, were treating the Philippine uh, sultanates as tributary, right. but as business part free of equal business right. partners, right. so that there is a, a 
tomb, a grave of the Sultan of Sulu in, in Shanghai, I think. I read that somewhere. Yeah, yeah. Yeah. So there is this tie that goes on. Um, even up to now in the southern Philippines, the business group that is able to survive terrorism and kidnapping and all that are the Chinese Filipinos. <laughs> they don't get touched. Uh, and so that, there's, that, there's that relationship that I think even the Chinese are aware of. Um, the, in, one interesting thing that I'd like to point out, the United States' interest on the Philippines has gone down. I mean, I teach a course in the Philippines here. I only have 12, 12 students. A course in the Philippines in Xiamen, in China, will have an enrollment of 100 students. Oh, okay. So there is really, I mean, the University of Beijing has three professors specializing on the Philippines. So there is that discrepancy that P Americans actually have to take into consideration. Well, uh, we don't have much time on the show, so uh, I wish I can talk to you more about like the Asian AIB and one bell one row. I mean, oh. and eventually what they call it the, uh, you know, China's grand plan is to connect uh, the whole Asia by rail, and then I think Philippines is part of the mm. part of the pictures. Yeah. Uh, and with the with the um, American not approving the TPP, you know, right. uh, and then uh, Japan now is in a panic mode, and I think Philippines is. Right. Uh, I think probably Philippines is part in the AIB already. I don't know whether he had to put in uh, they put in some money. I think not yet. I not think, yet, right? But, yeah. but I'm sure China will welcome. Yeah. Uh, I mean, the Chinese have built this interesting road from uh, from Xiamen down to Bangkok, uh, right? Through Burma, I think that's. Yeah. And then they just connect the bridge uh, to Myanmar. That, uh, and that, like two days ago, which is a huge yeah. project. So I used to stay in southern, northern Thailand, and it's I see all these uh, Chinese yeah. goods coming through the bridge. It's very exciting time actually in Asia. I mean, sometimes yeah. in Hawaii we can we don't get much of it, but when I go to California, I do see a lot of happening <laughs> over there, and, and and people are very excited. And I and actually the Filipino community in in California is quite active too in yeah. many ways. In many right. ways, yeah. Okay, so uh, well, we're going to the end of the program. Uh, thank you, uh, Professor Abinas, for coming to my program. Thank you very much. And sir, I hope to invite you back, you back sure, uh, sometime back. in the near future to talk more about sure. the exciting relationship yeah. between Philippines, America, yeah. and China. Our